Well, let's get right after it, okay? Uh, being a man is easy. That's so all you have to do is be able to stand in front of a urinal. <laughs> I have you know that none of you chose your gender. God gave it to you. Would you agree with that now? Just being a man is easy. Being a good man is a little more difficult. It takes a little work. But being a godly man is impossible without God. Can't pull her off without God. Would you agree with that? Got to have God in the mix of this thing. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, uh, Good master, what might I do that I might inherit eternal life? So this guy's thinking about life after death. Okay, obviously. And then Mark's account of it said, Jesus beholding him loved him. Sometimes I think the way Jesus answered him, because it was kind of a confrontational into your face, he said, why do you call me good? He said, there's none good but God. And I think he gave him a frozen frame to think about that. I think, he, I think Jesus looked into his eyes, and this, in other words, he's saying to the young man, either change how you address me, or acknowledge me for who I am. I you know that's what the gospel's about. Either acknowledge him for who he is. Who do men say that I am stuff? Who do you say that I am? And so he, he gives him that opportunity. Then he says he gives, gives him five out of the big ten. Okay, the Ten Commandments. Uh, honor your father and your mother. Don't kill, don't steal. The ones that everybody's familiar with. Not that there is no other God before me. Make no great... He didn't talk about that. He just says to him, these five. He said, I've done all of them ever since I've been a kid. Ever since my youth up, that says in the old King James. He said, yet what am I lacking? Anybody who's trying to work their way to heaven knows they can't do enough. Would you agree with that? There's always something in our past. How have you know? How have you got a few secrets that you know only God knows about, and you're glad only God knows about? <laughs> and say, what about them? Oh, you put them on the scales. What's going to happen to me? When it... So he knows something's lacking in his life. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Said, "I'll tell you what. You go sell all you have and come follow me, and you'll have great riches in heaven." But the man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. In other words, sight was more important to him than faith. He wanted the here and the now. He wanted eternity too, but he wanted the here and the now. He said, oh, maybe, I can, maybe I can restructure. Maybe I'll be all right, okay? And then he turns around and walks away. And his disciples said, Jesus, we could have used this guy. He's young and got money and got influence. That's a loose translation, but it's implied in there, okay? <laughs> they, can't, they can't believe it. You're letting this good guy get away. He gave him the only way, okay? It is all about Jesus. That's what he was trying to communicate to the young man. He let him walk away. And then the disciples in frustration said, because Jesus said, with great difficulty, will a rich man enter into heaven? A guy that's got his, his fix on here and now. It's hard for him to let go to realize this ain't worth a biscuit as far as getting me to heaven. It's hard to do this. And he knew this. And he says, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the disciples said, well, then who then can be saved? I love his answer. He said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I loved it. He got it. With God, you can't pull off Christian living without Christ. You can't. You can't. The theme that we're looking at developing godliness. I want to be more godly this time next year than I am right now. I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior. I want to add more virtue to my faith. I want the things that the Scripture tells me how to do. And I can't. God never designed the Christian life for us to pull off without Him, but be totally dependent upon Him. It develops relationship with God. I don't. I don't have a good theology. I have a relationship with God based upon faith in His Son Jesus Christ. He says, now try to pull off the life without me. You couldn't save yourself without me, and you can't live the Christian life without me. I want to know you, and I want you to know me, son. You've only got a breath to do it in. Come on. And here's some of the things we can do. He's talking about getting in the journey. Last night, I got to talk to a couple of the guys that came forward and trusted Christ, made their profession of faith last night. One guy said, he says, the first time he said, I've ever been here. And he said, I've been in and out of church for all my life. But he said, I've never been saved. Do you know that describes a lot of people that are going in and out of church and have never been saved? Would you agree with this? There's people in the pulpit that have never been saved. It's getting saved from what? The wrath of a holy God who paid the penalty. How do you know that God satisfied His own justice because He couldn't find anybody else to do it for Him? He saw for a man. He saw for him. Hey, can I find somebody to be an acceptable sacrifice to satisfy my righteousness? He found none, so he sent himself in the person of his son to become the acceptable sacrifice and then poured out on him all of his wrath because he loved us. Oh, don't think God didn't love you. Can I tell you something? If your hope of heaven was me, would be for me giving up one of my sons in order for you to go there, you're on your way to hell. <laughs> And I won't do it. And I'll tell you why. I don't love you enough. How many of you are glad I'm not God? Any of you are glad of that, okay? 
But we have a God who loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world. That whosoever would believe on him. What kind of whosoever's? Man, I got news for you. The haters of God. The insolent, the proud, the boasters, the inventors of evil. The self-righteous. I was so religious. And yet religiously lost people go to hell today. I need a savior. And God's provided only one. How of you do enjoy the gospel? Even though you're saved, you just enjoy hearing the truths of the gospel. <laughs> I want to get saved at my own sermons. I really do. I, <laughs> ah, this is good stuff. And I hope I never get over that, okay? By the way, last night we laid the foundation, which is the gospel. It is also the catalyst for everything else. It's why I want to do what I do. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 says, Only let your conduct, that's my behavior. See, my identity is totally in Christ. I have no other identity other than in Christ. I have one thing, there's only one thing that makes a difference between many, me and anybody else on the planet. It is Christ. I have no, no claim to fame. I have a wonderful Savior. Only let your conduct now line up with your, behavior, with your identity. If this is what you say you believe, then shouldn't it affect how you live? Somebody say amen. amen. It's this parakeet and the good theology and living like the devil. You've missed something somewhere along the line. Okay. How do you know the devil does show up in us every once in a while? Would any of you agree with that? Amen. How do you have days you don't feel Christian, think Christian, act Christian, but you're in Christ? How do you have those kind of days? Okay. How do you are glad you're not based upon how you're living, but upon how he lived? How about that one? All right. I got a Savior. See, that's why the Savior came. Savior from what? The wrath of God that I justly deserve. The judgment that I deserve. He saved me from that. And now he has saved me unto something. For we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, but not by good works. A person who receives Christ should become a better person. But they're not a, just because I'm better does not mean I'm saved. I'm working out my salvation. I can't work for it. But God's word, and in this process is where I really get to know God. And that journey starts with the first step. The gospel preached, the Holy Spirit convicts, draws you to himself, and you receive. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When you get saved, you'll look over your shoulder years later, and you'll say, you know what? This was all God's doing, and it is marvelous in my eyes. You're involved. I can't help but say it. We're involved in it. He'll call us. He gives us grace. These kind of things. I have to respond. But when you get down to the end of the journey, you look over and say, I was totally opposed to God. Why did he do this? It is the wonderful grace of Jesus. The wonderful grace of God. And you can rejoice. And by the way, that wonder allows you to worship without wonder at why God. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, or why unworthy Christ and love redeemed me for his own. Or I know not, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Can I tell you something? If you finish well, you'll step into heaven and say, Glory to God, it was all you're doing. Would you agree with that? Man, I don't know if I'll ever get to the sermon. <laughs> Only let your conduct be as become of the gospel of Christ. That whether Paul says, I be, whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, striving to get, with one mind, striving together for the cause of the gospel, for the faith of the gospel. You're in it, you're striving. The Christian life is flat out work. Getting saved is simple as falling off a log if God's in it. <laughs> but man, the Christian life, if the Christian life were easy, more people would be living it. So all you have to do is take up a cross and die. Oh, that sounds fun. You die, okay? How about you die in this one? No, you die. Okay. Well, last night I did the work of an evangelist. I want to do the work of an evangelist, but I am not an evangelist. I'm introduced sometimes in places they call and ask you to speak. End up and our evangelist is, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I, I don't think Paul had the gift of evangelism. The Apostle Paul didn't have the gift. I think he was an exhorter. I think he preached the gospel and did the work of that. In fact, I think Timothy, who was probably administratorly gifted, didn't have the gift of that. But he says, don't forget, he said, do the work of an evangelist. So I do the work of an evangelist. I have only known two God-gifted, God-called, God-anointed evangelists so far. I may have a third one. It's coming up on the horizon. I just rubbed shoulders with him again. And I'm wondering, if, I think your gift, when God saves you, gives you a gift, okay? He entrusts it to you to say, develop it, stir it up, get it going. 
And then all of a sudden you get to realizing, this is my gift and this is my calling. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm a proclaimer. More of a prophetic background, not as a foreteller, or a, but a foreteller. I can't tell you the future. I can't even tell you the weather tomorrow. I don't have that kind of prophecy stuff. How many of you know them old boys in the Old Testament and New Testament that were prophets, wrote things that haven't even been fulfilled yet, but they seem to be clicking off pretty close. Would you agree with that? Okay. They were prophets in a different sense, but I may proclaim, and my gift is stirring. I stir people up. <laughs> That's the reason I don't have to do Red Bull. Okay? I, I, <laughs> it's contagious. Somebody who's passionate about something is contagious. I have had guys come up to me afterwards and say, I don't believe a word you said, but I think you do. Well, hallelujah! <laughs> I don't want you to wonder if I believe this stuff. How do you know passion does communicate? Would you agree with that? And I, I guess, and some of you guys come because you know I'm stirred up, and you get stirred up. It, it, it has that effect. Fear. He said, "Get away from here." I don't want. Getting said, "Go home if you're afraid." Twenty thousand, twenty-two thousand of them left. You know why? He didn't want them cont- contaminating the rest of the guys who had the courage. And it happens that way. And people with courage affect other guys with courage. I love to be with people who are bold in the Lord. In fact, I get a little more bold. Our son Brian is one of those evangelists. God gifted, God called, God anointed. No question about it. Every time I hear him preach, I want to get saved. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, Tom, aren't you? Say, Come on. Do you know what I mean by this? Oh, that's it. He has the gift that has calling. He has a ministry with open air campaigners. He preaches on the streets. It's the part of the gospel we can out. We just have gospel. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, what are you talking about? G.O. is the first part of the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Teaching you to observe what sort of things I command you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Wherever you go, he says, I'll be with you. I know Philip was the evangelist. Oh, Philip, I got news for you. God picked him up and shoot him over to some guy. He's trapped alongside his chariot. And the guy said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm reading the book of Isaiah. He said, well, do you understand what you're reading? I don't have a clue. He said, well, I know what you're reading. He said, well, jump in. This is a, how you know this is a fast story? Would you agree with this? He gets in and he opens up. Ah! He says, I got it. Okay, he's an evangelist. His, and by the way, when he was done, boom, he's gone to someplace else. Evangelist. It's good when a pastor has the gift of evangelism. Can I tell you something? They don't make as good of a pastor as the guy who has the gift of pastor-teacher. That's true. You've got a bunch of infants here. Church is filled with infants. don't know how to grow. Well, glory to God, people are getting saved. How do you know that everybody has a gift who knows the Lord as Savior? And we're supposed to be about that. And Brian, it's about this kind of thing. The other gifted evangelist is Conrad Del Torres, a Cuban from Miami, a drug runner, got saved in prison. How do you know God does things like this? Would you agree with that? Man, when I heard him preach, I preached in his church. I didn't know I hadn't met him. They asked me to come and I spoke in his church. And I spoke about an hour. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought, well, you know, I've never been there before. Usually you give him a soft one at first, you know, blow him out of the saddle. I preach about an hour. People right with me and everything. And I sat down. He got up and preached for another hour. Whoa, is this the kind of church I want to be a part of? That's a preach fest. When he's done, let's have somebody else. Okay. <laughs> That's coming from a preacher. How do you know that? That's coming from a preacher. But Brian has that gift. And uh, I thank God for Brian. He stirs me, challenges me. Brian has a prayer letter. He's quit his job with seven children and now is with open air campaigners. And serving the Lord there, he goes to the streets. He goes to Silver Bells and they have the lighting of the Christmas tree at the Capitol. Sets him up a little booth alongside the <laughs> sausage vendors and everything else is going to be there. And he preaches the gospel. And people stop. And he takes people from his church. In fact, his pastor. I haven't introduced my sons. Ben, you just got here. And I'm glad you did. Would you stand up? This is our firstborn, Benjamin. And uh, he is... <laughs> oh, boy. He loves the Lord. Ben loves the Lord. Don't have the gift of evangelism. I believe it's exhortation. I believe you have that gift. And loves to teach. He went to Africa for a year and a half with his family. And taught a bunch of pastors there. Grass hut, dirt floors. And I think his gift really was revealed to him there. He loves to do this. He loves to study the Word of God. Loves the Lord. His pastor is right in front of him. Norm, one of the pastors. Uh, another elder, Ron. I don't know who all you've got here, okay? Bill's not here. Your other brother, pastor. And uh, anyway, then there's Michael, our son-in-law. One of them who's on staff up here. Missionary serving the Lord. Been here for seven years. He's got a zipline shirt on. And he's probably one of them guys that was catching you or kicking you off. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what your job is up there. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, and then, Brian, you're here. Brian, would you stand up? And he is an evangelist. i got news for you. He loves the Lord and preaches the gospel. So, <laughs> Brian needs prayer. He went through their training of about two to three weeks. They waived the two-year training that they normally have, where they ship you off and go to Texas and train you there for two years because they could see the spark of the Holy Spirit in his life. And 
So we're going to waive that. So he's now the Michigan representative here in in this particular state, and uh, he goes. He goes to a public. He got a public high school. He goes. Seventy-five to eighty students come to hear the gospel. He's taking them through the gospel. Three churches in the area buy the pizzas. The kids used to come for the pizzas. They don't come for the pizzas anymore. They come to hear truth. He surveyed them one time. Said, "How many of you here have a Bible?" Two of them raised their hand. Brian, what was it? It was some. That was a different setting. Was that at the school? Nobody had a Bible. But anyway, how if you know we're living in an ever-darkening culture where the light of God's Word is being pushed out of school, out of government, out of everything? And it's amazing. It, you don't have to go to a third world country to do missions work. In fact, they're going to be sending them, probably are, here to America right now. Since we are no longer a Christian nation, I better not go there, okay? <laughs> but a nation of many faiths. <laughs> Moving right along... I wonder what happened in the heavenlies when that statement was made. I wonder what things shifted. Not to our favor. <clears throat> How of you can tell, I'd like to just jump into that right now, okay? <clears throat> no, it's not in my notes, and I never deviate from my notes. <laughs> Is my nose growing at all? I don't even know why I write notes. I don't pay any attention to them. But I wrote these out this morning. The ink ain't even dry them. I purposed myself to put them on one page so you could get out of here at lunch, okay? But I haven't said anything on them yet, so. <laughs> Brian goes into jails, goes to the rescue missions, preaches on the streets, goes to MSU, goes to LCC. And he's not waiting for doors to open. And by the way, God is opening doors. He'll be preaching in a place that he had no plan of somebody coming along who had authority to be there as the police are telling him, the campus police are saying, you can't do that here unless you have somebody on staff that gives you the... And somebody on staff goes by and hears this and says, I'll give him permission. I'm on staff. You can set it up over here. Because he got this little preacher matic He's got it on a uh, dollies and he sets it up like this and opens up. Within 60 seconds, he's got this thing out here and he starts painting or he does a few tricks and people stop. I cannot believe it. People stop and engage in this. And he can present the gospel in 15 minutes and then talk to people afterwards, which is what he loves. God is making an apologist out of that evangelist. He's learning how to defend his faith. When people ask him questions on the street that he, can't answer from, that he cannot answer from Scripture, it drives him to the book and he's getting the stuff. But all the training they gave him as far as how to raise funds to support missionaries, Brian came to me and said, Dad, I can't do that. I can't do the self-addressed stamped envelope kind of gig. I just feel that we, we ruined our kids by reading to them missionary stories like uh, Hudson Taylor, God's work done in God's way will not lack God's supply. Uh, what's that guy, George Mueller? How do you know that will wreck your philosophy of finances? Would you agree with that? And we read it, he said, I'm just going to trust God to do that. So he's not going the conventional route, but he does need prayer. Um, pray for him. He has a newsletter that shares his, here's his family, prayer request, what he's doing, where he's going to be, some of the people that he takes from his church, as well as other churches. He goes to churches and trains them to go out on the street. We've lost our, we're just Christian, we're not evangelical Christians anymore. There's no other kind than evangelical. Somewhere, somehow, we've got to be sharing our faith to a lost and dying world. He has pictures and just things in there. Brian has some of them. If you want one of his prayer letters, did you put it in the back? Or do you just, there's some in the back. If you'd like to find out what he's doing, get it on. By the way, how many of you know that if you're not giving, going, or praying, you're out of the will of God? Say, I can't go. I cannot do what he does. Can I tell you that? I can't do it. I can do some, but I, I, I can't do what he does. He has the gift and the calling. I've not, Brian was a mama's boy. He was as shy. I, I couldn't believe. For him, I've never seen anybody more bold. If he talks to you more than five minutes and he doesn't know your spiritual status, he will talk to you about the Lord. That's just the way it is. By the way, I wish I had more of that. Do any of you know what I'm talking about there? How many of you have missed opportunities of the Holy Spirit saying, come on, just open your mouth, I'll fill it. And you think, well, uh, no, I don't believe, uh, uh, maybe somebody uh, uh, negotiate. Brian don't negotiate. Brian will walk down the road and a bunch of students up here in the grandstands. He walks on by and the Lord says, why don't you go back and talk to them? And he, the first response was something to this effect. Well, I, I'm heading home. 
couple more steps. He said, did I just disobey you, God? God said, yep. Okay, I'll turn around and go back here. <laughs> he went and did a rope trick. I don't know what kind of thing you did to get that. Went a hearing. He spent 30 minutes talking with these kids about their soul. And how do you know that people do want to know somebody who believes truth? Because you live in a culture that says there's no absolutes. Well, then what is life about? We don't have a clue. And he stopped to talk to my burden. You know why I came back to talk to you? God told me to. That will win a hearing. Anyway. Launching pad. 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Uh, if you want to turn to one, let me see. I think I, first, turn to 2 Peter. You turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and wait for me and I'll be there eventually. 1 Peter chapter 4, that's our launching pad into our theme of godliness and exercising and stuff. It says this, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and rather exercise thyself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Remember this, exercise is something you do. It's not just something you acknowledge you need to do. Something you do. How many of you know that thinking exercise will not strengthen your arms? Oh yeah, I know how to do something with that. I know how to, you know, the rehabilitation. It's all about exercising and doing things you know you need to do. The Greek word for exercise is, get this, gymnasia. What English word do we get? Gymnastics. How many of you know them dudes that do that stuff like this are in shape? Well, somebody say Amen. You couldn't pinch any more fat off of some of them guys you can off of this pulpit. I mean, they have worked themselves into shape to do what they know they need to do to compete in that arena. Would you agree with that? They go to the gymnasium and do gymnastics. It's not one day saying, I think I'm going to be a gymnast. How many of you know if I took off running and wanted to do one of them cartwheels, you'd be calling 911. Somebody say amen to that. Would you agree? It ain't going to happen. Do you know what? I might. I don't know if that would ever happen or not, but I might be able to if I started working out with people who knew what to do and teach me how to do it, till finally I might be able to do one of them someday, but I surely couldn't do it now. But you can exercise yourself to get there, but you can do something, okay? This is very significant. It's a doing thing. Jude verse 20 says this, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Twelve years ago, I weighed 200. I was in the 280s, okay? I was on blood pressure medicine, and I was just a physically, I was a time bomb. At that age and about that time, I'd played four years of college football. I had one time been in good shape. Now I've eaten enough donuts to fill this chapel. How <laughs> you know that's not a good combination? And I didn't do any exercise. And I was just a timing, tick, ticking bomb ready to go off. And I said, I've got to do something. The doctor said, you've got to do something. You're going to do or die. You're going to kill yourself doing this. I said, okay. So Joyce and I started walking. And then one day I started jogging. I ran about, a, I don't think I ran a quarter of a mile the first time, maybe 100 yards, 150 yards. And I was sucking wind so bad. Yeah! Yeah! I couldn't even breathe. But we kept at it. We kept at it. Within a few months, I'm running a half a mile. And man, I'm sweating like a hog. And I'm starting to lose some weight. And pretty soon it was a mile. And pretty soon two miles. And pretty soon three miles. And I was getting shape and I dumped about 40 pounds. It was a gradual... How many of you wish you could do one push-up push and look like Charles Atlas? <laughs> How about this one? But ye, beloved, building up yourselves. How you would like to hire someone to do your exercise and you get in shape? Do you know that's what we do with Chris? We'll hire the pastor. You're the paid professional. Get me in shape. And when he tells you to exercise, give me another message. I don't want that one. You mean I have some responsibility to do something? If you ever want to get in shape spiritually. See, I want to become godly. The, the godliness theme. That's what I want to head in that direction. Listen to this verse. But ye beloved, I'll give it to you. But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. I'll talk to you about prayer in a minute. See, and keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And of others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Now unto Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the... Only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now. I love that. You mean to tell me, Tom, that you could live a life that would bring God glory now as well as forever? You see, it says, now. But you believe the believe it says most holy faith. No. Our text verse, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is. Your physical exercise profits you now and now only. It's over. 
But spiritual exercise profits you now and as well as in the life to come. Whoa. I'll take a piece of that one. Because this one here is a... And that one there is eternal. This is one grain of sand. That's the seashores of eternity. I can do something now that will last me forever. How many of you I said last night, we lack incentive. I don't think I'm going to say anything new. This may be a new avenue to take toward the same old message. There's, a, there's an eternal benefit to living godly now. Godliness. Like God wants me to live. I need that. I want that. Now is. Fables. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. You know what a fable is? It's fictitious and it's man to man. You know what a parable is? It's man to God. Jesus taught in parables, not in fables. Say amen. amen. He didn't teach in fables. Some people won't accuse him of that, but he taught in parables which had to do with man to God. Fables have to do with man to man. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, I wish I may, I wish I might, have the wish I wish tonight. You'd be amazed how many people have that as their philosophy of life. They go to the casinos and wish themselves into something, hoping something. Um, when you wish upon a star. <laughs> you know what? That makes a good fable. I mean, that Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket, that's a good fable. But I sure wouldn't want to live my life based upon that. Makes no difference where you are. It makes a difference where you are. Please say amen to that. Would you agree? Where are you at? I think that's what... If I'm not mistaken, I think that's exactly what God said to Adam. Where are you? How do you think God might have known? And we never asked us, where am I? He didn't ask where you've been or where you're going. He said, where, where am I? Because this is the only time I've got. Yesterday's gone and tomorrow may never come. Where are you? One of the fables hammered to us is that there's all kinds of gods. No, there's one God, but there's all kinds of names for that God. That's a fable. Acts 4.12 says this. By the way, polytheism as opposed to monotheism. Monotheism, this book, one God. One God. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in the other, for there is none on the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There is no other God. 1 Timothy 2.4, for, for there is one God, and one meeting between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. One God. Ephesians 4, 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in us all. There is one God. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none other. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things which have not yet been done. Behold, all my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. God said to Isaiah, he said, who are you going to liken to me? Who will you consider my equal? I love this. He said, is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God besides me. I don't know of any. This is God talking to Jeremiah, to Isaiah. In other words, you say, I don't like the God of the Bible. So you stand before the only true God and you say to him, I want a different God. Do you know of any? <laughs> I don't know of any, God says. I don't make a light of this too much, but can you imagine the God of the universe saying, I don't know of any other God besides me. I'm it. So you don't like him? No other options. I'm enjoying this whether you are or not, okay? Are you in Second Peter yet? I've been waiting for you. All right. Second Peter chapter 1 says this, in verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness... By the knowledge of him, through the uh, knowledge of him who has called us unto glory and virtue, by which are given to us. I'm going to just go right through this, and I want to focus on verse 16 because it deals with something we're, I'm trying to talk about with regard to fables. We're talking about godliness, and God says, "I've given you everything you need. Here it is. You can either take it and run with it, or you can just say, yep, there it is. It pertains to life and godliness, eternal life, and how a person should live out that life.'" By which are given us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers. I love that word. This is a partaker. When you eat lunch, you're partaking. It's getting in. Partakers of the divine nature. We already know the old nature. Now I can partake, because of his promises, the divine nature. God dwelling in me. Christ liveth in me. 
His Spirit filling, dwelling in me. That kind of stuff. That pertains to life and godliness and the knowledge of Him who calls glory and virtue. By which are given us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust and besides this giving all diligence undistracted zeal Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control patience, godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. That's the objective right there. That's where you're headed. That you'll be able to love, which is this way, in a capacity you couldn't manufacture on your best day. It's the kind of love that God, in fact, enables us to, as we add virtue and faith and these kind of things to our life, and godliness, we find ourselves moving into an arena we knew we could never manufacture. It's loving people. You say you love God, you better love people. How many of you know God's easier to love than people? Please say amen to that. Would you agree with that? Man, God has made some weird people. They're not all like us. Do you see what just happened to me? If you ain't like me, you ain't lovable. I can't love this jerk. Never mind. We'll move on here. For if these things be in you and abound, they, they, the things, shall make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence. Oh, he's the reward of them that diligently seek him. <laughs> give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. For so an, in- for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and are already established in the present truth. Yea, I think it fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle. I love that. Peter's got it. He knows there's more to him than the shell. It's what's in this thing. He said, as long as I'm in here, he said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle. How many of you already know you're closer to the end than you are to the beginning? You're in the second half. Do you know what I mean by that? You ain't going to do as many as you've already done. There ain't no way I'm doing this. <laughs> I don't think so. How many of you know if you're in the second half, you'll have to admit that first half went by in a blur. Say amen. amen. <clears throat> so he said, I'm putting her off. It's coming. I know it's coming. Verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able... This, these books are nothing more than an endeavor that my grandchildren leave a legacy of faith. If time stands, this is what I saw as the essence, the essentials of, of living. Be born again. Start getting communication, relationship with God. Get into His Word and let Him speak to you. Man, establish your home. You're not my ministry, man. My wife, my children, now grandchildren, that's my ministry. I can fake you. I can't fake them. When somebody lives in your home, you can't fake it. They'll either know it's the real deal or it's not the real deal. My wife has been with me. My precious wife has been with me through all of my journey. We have a relationship with each other that if God weren't in it, can I tell you something? We have never once mentioned divorce, but we have talked of homicide a few times, okay? (laughs) In fact, the hardest thing for me coming up here is leaving her. This old man's in love with that woman. That little old silver-haired beauty. Her and I, night before last, sat on the swing. We hadn't sat on it in weeks. Just gone. Three weekends ago, we did the whole week in California. Come home, get in the car. When I went home 14 hours, take off and spend a week in Arkansas preaching three times a day. I was either studying, preaching, or with people. And you may think the, the ministry is a cakewalk. It, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Then took off last week and did a weekend conference up in um, men's retreat in northern Wisconsin. And come home, we had a few days, and I said, honey, it was balmy out, moon, and we went and sat on that swing. And she leaned over into me. Good night. You think we was on a date. We was smooching, hugging, kissing, and talking about life, talking about growing old together. That's the way it ought to be, man. I know people have been married 35, 40, 45 years and getting divorces. I feel like slapping them. It's in Luke. Somewhere it's in Luke. I don't know. <laughs> Do you edit these tapes at all, Paul? I'll take, that, I'll take that one out if you could. <clears throat> Anybody know where we're at? Now here, back here. Here's the verse I want. Okay, we finally made it to the verse I want. Okay. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things in remembrance, for we have not followed.
cunningly devise fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of Him in His majesty. If you want a few verses for you, know what old Peter's talking about? When they left the borders of Caesarea Philadelphia, he took them up into exceedingly high mount, not far from there. And he said, Peter, James, and John, come, I want to show you something. And he was transfigured before them. Where moments before he had spoken with the word of God, God had revealed to him, here Peter's about to open his mouth, he'd have been better off to keep her shut. He's transfigured and here's Moses and Elijah. And how he knew them, how you know they didn't have portraits of them in those days. God's revealing to who these are. And he sees them. He says, it's so good for us to be here. We'll build three bulls. And the voice from heaven said, shut up. That's a loose translation, okay? He said, be still and hear ye him. Just listen to Jesus. I even know Moses ain't the Savior and neither is Elijah. Would you say amen to that? There are three. I don't think so. Just Christ. Just Christ. The law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Elijah is nothing more than one who says, Get the road ready, folks. Here he comes. Make straight his paths. I mean, let the valleys fill up and the mountains drop down. Let every crooked place be made straight. And hear ye the word of the Lord. And you look at John the Baptist's ministry. It was all pointed toward Christ. He must increase. I must decrease. Behold the Lamb of God. Take away the sin of the world. He knew it. He said he got it. And he was just here. John the Baptist nothing more than Jesus is Elijah. Fables. You and I live in a world of fables. And it's coming at us disguised as truth. Evolution as the origin of man is a fable. Amen. Boy, that was a weak amen. Maybe I'll change my sermon right now. You know, you're being bombarded constantly as fact. That you and I, I watched something the other night. We were in the hotel and it was the history of the world in two hours. Any of you see that stupid insanity? By the way, I, wanna, I hope I'm not being obscure. <laughs> Say, well, I don't believe that. But then you go to the grave with what you believe and I'll go with what I believe. I can't, I got news for you. I got to live on what I believe. I can't live on what you believe. I, 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 uh, how, how many billion years it was? 4.3 or 7.4, whatever it was. Boom! Yeah, I'm glad somebody laughed at that. I said, oh, this is going to be good. Did you see it, Norm? Did you see it? I couldn't watch it. I couldn't watch it all. I started taking notes of the insanity of it. Of course, now we've got it down to, you know, three point some million years. And, you know, recently, just jump. I mean, you can cover in two minutes the first seven billion or whatever. They... As fact. As fact. Not even up for debate. See, when I was a kid, that was a theory, a philosophy. Now it is taught as fact. Fable. It's a man to man. And it's fictitious and it's a lie. Amen. God made me. Amen. And when your old daddy and your mama got together in that, whew, they didn't even follow that or not. <laughs> and them thousands of them little polywogs are going, whew, and God says, I think I'll take that one. <laughs> they called it conception. For some of you guys, did you, any of you take anatomy or biology at all? How do you know it wasn't the stork? How about that one, okay? <laughs> And cell division, in God's miraculous creative power, cell division. And you end up with your DNA, your genetic code, your fingerprints, your eye maps, and there's nobody like you in all of creation. Coincidence? Give me a break. Where would you like it? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I wonder and marvel and awe at God's creative power. Who spoke into existence said before the sun was ever, not billions of years, a fragment shot off of who knows where. He made light. In the beginning God said, let there be light. And there was light. And the light separated from the darkness. And he called the light day and the darkness night. And the morning and evening were the first day. And you got to unfortunately, he makes a sun to rule, to shine upon the earth. We are the planet that's the darling of God's eye in all of this universe. No awe, no wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. I'm glad I get the chills over this kind of stuff. I can live off this kind of stuff. 
You pull that out and I'm aimlessly wandering through life as a hunk of amoeba and masses of atoms that just fell together over time. What an insult to the average thinking person. There's too much design. You can't take the eyeball and say, that thing is filled with design. From those little tiny reflectors and refractors that are taking light and turn it upside down and then put your eye, optic nerve spins her back up so you and I can see, come on. The eardrum that's receiving all, come on. That's not the message. Let's move on. <laughs> fables. I'm not going to go through all that. I've got a bunch of fables listed here. Let me give you this. In Paul's letter, because we're dealing with Paul, first Timothy, the first letter he writes to Timothy is a young pastoral. He, he says this. In his second letter, he's in the Mamertine prison, probably away. In fact, he says, For I'm now ready to be off in the time of my departure is at ham. Some commentators think he may even hear the footsteps of the executioners that are coming because Nero, the lunatic's on the throne, and God's going to use him to bring Paul home. And that's a good death. Man, I'm, whoo, whoo, straight to glory. How many of you have looked at death some way? If I had a choice to die, a heart attack ain't a bad way to go. In fact, in fact, right in a sermon, I'd love to be preaching away. And, and if I go down, keep your hands off me, you EMTs and freaks that got to raise everybody back to life. Leave me alone. In fact, my last words will say, I'll see you in a few minutes because you're coming right behind me. How do you know death can be hard? It's the last enemy that will be destroyed. I've seen people die hard. My sister was five years dying with cancer. That was a hard death. She was just a shell of a person. I've seen people die hard. I don't know how I'm going, but I know where I'm going. So how I'm going, His grace will, su- His grace will be sufficient no matter how it is. He'll still be my God. <clears throat> Please let me quote this verse. Second Timothy, Paul is writing to him, and he says this, chapter 4, verse 1. He said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine, for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall turn themselves to fables. How many of you know the nature of man without God is I would rather believe a lie than the truth. How many of you know we're living in a culture that is wanting to believe a lie? We have been given to that now. And the, the, the stealing of our minds have happened. And so we're more vulnerable to a lie than to believe the truth. And God says, this is truth. This is truth. So preach the word. Just preach the word. Well, you need incentive. I'm actually to where I wanted to be now. Incentive. Why don't I do what I know I ought to do? How have you ever asked yourself that question? How have you ever known what you should do and still didn't do it? Any of you? <laughs> I've known, it's not a matter of not knowing. How have you know before that old doctor ever told me I need to lose some weight and start exercising and change my diet? I knew that before. How have you knew that? But I wasn't doing nothing. I wasn't doing nothing. It's the same thing spiritually. I mean, you take this physical thing and all the benefits that you get from receiving, and I take this over here to the spiritual realm, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I know I should do it. I just don't do it. These are doing it. But be doers of the word, not hearers only. But he that hears the word and doeth it not, like a man looks at his face and says, Yep, I'm a mess. I'm a physical wreck. But he walks away saying, I'm going to do something about that. But he forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, I love that. And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but do the work. That boy is going to be blessed in deeds. Why well, call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you who you're like. Whosoever heareth, these words, and do with them. I'll show you under whom he's like. He's like a man who built a house. And he dug deep and laid the foundation upon the rock. That is Christ Jesus, other foundation, and no man lay. And when the storm arose and beat vehemently upon the house, it couldn't even shake it. Why? It was founded on the rock. He got that thing to... But whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, is like a man who built his house upon the sand. And when the storm arose and the flood beat him, immediately it fell and great was the ruin of that house. Now, I can't change that. That's just flat in the Bible. I, I know that can happen again and again. It does happen. I need to start doing something with what I say I believe because the Christian life is so much easier to talk than it is to walk. And I struggle with that. I still struggle with that. And you'd think I'd know better. I do know better, but I still don't do everything I'm supposed to be doing. I I still don't. So let's take something. Here was the incentive for me. Israel. I left Israel with an eschatological urgency. In fact, it is now, I'm starting to exercise this. It's part of my, I said it this morning, perhaps today. Perhaps today. There's a day coming when the last prophetic sermon will be preached. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. All the guys have been saying for centuries, Jesus is coming. One of these days, it's going to happen. Boy, would I love to be preaching on it when it happens. Woo! 
What a climax to a sermon, huh? <laughs> Good sermon, Brother Harmon, as we're flying up to glory. Man, that would be all right. Well, I left with an urgency, perhaps today. I'm starting to exercise myself because I have lived most... 99% of my Christian journey and never gave God a thought about He might come today unless I was studying or preaching or reading. I keep living like every day is the same and He's never going to come. Oh, yeah, well, I wouldn't say He wouldn't come, but I'm living like... See, you can say I believe He's coming, but live like He ain't. Did any of you get that or not? How, how have you been willing to admit that? You've been guilty of that at least on one rare occasion in your journey of faith. Any of you? How about too much of your journey of faith? How about a hand on that one? Too much of my journey has been lived like it's going to be today and like tomorrow and... It, It's just going to continue on as it always has from the beginning of creation. Israel's got that urgency. Our guide, his name was Yuval, beautiful, dark, olive-skinned, heavy-bearded man, kind of like what I expect Jesus to look like. How do you know Jesus will not look like a Caucasian Republican when we get to heaven? Would you agree with that? Good night. Our guide was a flat-out handsome man. He'd fought in the Yom Kippur War. He was an, there's a name for what do they call an Israelite who's born in Israel. His dad came from another country and fought in the 1948 when they declared their independence war. I mean, it, it, this guy was just... Well, anyway, he'd been leading tours for 20 years. A decorated veteran in the Israeli army. And four years ago, finally, one of the guys on our team went up to him because he's talking like a believer. And we're thinking, we don't know if this guy's a believer or not. He's just leading the tour. He's using scripture and stuff. He said, is Jesus your Messiah? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I've been leading these tours for 20 years. He said, four years ago, God connected dots. We missed our Messiah. Jesus says, I went, whoa, man, he got it. And what a blessing. From then on out, we felt brotherhood kinship. Oh, my goodness, what a blessing. And he would tell us facts. He was just constantly sharing things with us. Nine days we were with him. And he said, uh, 20 years ago, 80% of Israel was agnostic. They believed in God. They had a clue who he was. Oh, yeah, they'd hear about their history. Yeah. They're just, they're not, they, were, they were just as worldly as us. Do you know what I mean by that? <laughs> but he said, now that, that figure is much, much lower. He said, uh, you got Zionists. Oh, I love them Zionists. And you better love them too. That are looking for his first coming. That's what they're hoping their Messiah is going to And they, things are set up. Oh, can I tell you things are set up? I love to go to the Wailing Wall. There's a guy with a yarmulke on with the curls. He's packing a 9 millimeter Glock next to his prayer shawl. And, These people are ready for something's going to happen. Okay. Oh, it was just cool. It was just cool to be there. And he said, we've got it. Why is all the world focusing on this little piece of real estate that isn't bigger than a postage stamp? Why is everybody hating this place? Because God said, one of the, just before the coming of the Lord, all the nations of the world are going to hate you. That means all means America. And we're not far from that. Of disowning our allegiance and acknowledging a claim to a Palestinian state, and we acknowledge that, and the UN buys that. Can I tell you something? You've got a mixture for the coming of the Lord. How close? Come on. You don't have to read your Bible. Watch the news. It'll speak of this now. My chill out time. <laughs> Do you know what? When God gave them this land, the land of Canaan, Mediterranean, there's a valley there. I got, the first time I got to preach in Israel, I had to preach. I didn't have to. I got the privilege of preaching four times in Israel. And the people we went with, they paid for my ticket. And we paid for Joyce's. They paid for my ticket if I'd preach four times. And they tell you that morning where you're supposed to preach. And they wanted to 15 to 20 minutes. Don't get your hopes up. I did it then. I'm not doing it now, okay? <laughs> and I said, okay. They said, we want you to speak at Megiddo. Megiddo is the mount. Megiddo is the valley. If you put the Aramaic word har in front of Megiddo, you have harmageddo. Anybody know what that word is? Yeah. It's nothing more than Armageddon. And I'm standing up here, the fortified, one of the four fortified cities that Solomon fortified to overlook a valley that if you're coming from Af- Af- here's Egypt, okay? If you come down the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and over here to Egypt. How do you know them places are on the news today? Down here to Egypt, Libya, North Africa, Ethiopia, right there. The, con- the largest continent on the planet is Africa. And if you want to go from Africa by land, and you want to go to, let's see, you come up through, the, you have to go through this valley called the Valley of Jezreel. It's also called the Valley of Slaughter. It's where uh, you talk about biblical battles that were fought there. Unbelievable. At the end of the valley, at Mount Gilboa, is where Saul and Jonathan died in a battle. I mean, this is where Deborah and Barak fought against the Midian. Ah, 
Unbelievable things happened in this valley. It's also called the Valley of Slaughter. And in the last great battle that will ever be fought on the planet will be fought between God and His forces and the devil and His forces. Will be fought in this valley. And I'm standing up here looking behind where they have excavated down to the Solomon's... When Solomon, in fact, fortified the city. Had 150, 200 white stallions that ran chariots that if something went down through the valley because you had if you're going by land and you're coming from Africa and let's say you want to go to the east do you want to know where you go? you go up through Israel to a town called Damascus one of the oldest cities on the planet and you hang a right and you find yourself at the Euphrates going down through a place you may have heard of Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan you keep going you got India you got China you want to go from Africa to this part of the world trade routes you got to come through this valley if you want to hang a left at Damascus, you know where you go? You go through Turkey, you go through Greece, you go through Italy, you go through France, England. Can I just eliminate all them little small countries and jump into the USSR? All of the world at this time has to travel. God strategically put them there so they would evangelize the world. The trade routes of the world went through this. At the north end of this valley... Oh, at the north end is Mount Carmel. Anybody know anything that might have went down at Mount Carmel? This wild-eyed prophet said, never mind, I can't go to... I love that scene. I just love it. Maybe he's out to the bathroom right now. Nothing's happening. I want you soaking mine down. Hit it! He didn't do it that way. Now, would you agree with that? I'm giving you the really abbreviated version of that, baby. And what did the people say? The Lord is God. The Jehovah, he's God. Jehovah, he's God. Not Baal. They kill all the prophets of Baal. We got to stand up there. When we looked down there, and we went down in the valley, right down here, we looked up there and we saw an Air Force base. We didn't know what it was when we saw it. It wasn't until we were in the valley that five Israeli jets went over us at treetop level and it literally shook us. We thought, oh my goodness, are we under attack? And our, our guy goes, that's our security system. No problem. He said, you know that little... Two runways like that that you saw in that valley from down at Mount Carmel. He said, that's an Air Force base. He said, it's all underground. They come out of there at 400 miles an hour. And they have the length of a flight deck on an aircraft carrier and they're airborne. He said, that one that goes like that, they land them like they would. He said, 60 seconds from the time they hit the ground, they're back under this bunker. We've got them around Israel. How do you know Israel's ready for something big? Would you agree with that? There's a battle. By the way, the, you ask any country that's honest and they'll say the best air force in the world is the Israeli air force. It was neat to be there. Uh-uh. And I got to preach. You know what I preached on? Because they just give you just from the morning to now. And I don't know where the Valley of Dry Bones was. But there was an old boy named Ezekiel. He was a crazy prophet. Would you agree? Probably never... Little John the Baptist kind, bony finger. <laughs> Some of you ain't getting this, but that's all right. And he's living with the common people over in Babylon, the captive, and saying to the people, I told you that what Isaiah and Jeremiah were saying were true. We didn't believe it, and God fulfilled his prophecy against us, and we're here. And Daniel's also another prophet, and he's inside the, the palace. He's doing his ministry there, and Ezekiel's out here doing his. And God gives him a vision one day, and the hand of the Lord is upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Now, he's in Babylon, but the vision was, you want to talk a valley in Israel? You talk the valley of Jezreel, which, by the way, is a valley that is feeding most of England and much of Europe. It's feeding them. You want to know Why? When, when they took it away in 48, Arabs weren't all that been out of shape. It wasn't worth anything anyway. It was just a desert. I mean, you know, God promised to make it in a fruitful field. I never saw any more beehives any place in the world than in, in Israel. A land of milk. Somebody help me. I mean, you had a little stand some honey. How do you know that if you have bees, they're for a purpose of pollination? Fruits. I mean, you talk about pollination. And you know how they irrigated? They ran their hoses down and put a little hole in it. They didn't waste a drop of water. Water's precious there. You know what one of the greatest reserves of water is in the world, in that part of the world? It is not far from Jerusalem. You know what the Bible says? When he touches his foot down on that Mount of Olives, she splits and says, water's going to gush out of there and change the salt sea and turn it into fresh water. Amen. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> or is this accurate? I mean, when I left there, I said, you would be hard-pressed to convince me this book isn't accurate. I'm talking about details. From when you come out of the place, you come out of the city, and you turn to the left, there's a high place there. They've uncovered it. There it is. 
in the town of Hazor. When they said Joshua burned her down, they have found this city. That's been, this city has been rebuilt, rebuilt, rebuilt. They found at the timetable absolute ashes and cracked stones from the heat. Joshua burned her. What a coincidence. When we're down walking through this tunnel where they've excavated four stories down, we're walking along the wall of which the Solomon built his tunnel on, four stories down, in a place I didn't like it because you had to bend down. It's just hewn out of rock. We got down here to this open spot. And he, he said, you see this big rock right here? The stone cutters messed up on it. They took a, they've been to cut, there's grains. I don't know about stone cutting, but there's grains and granite and different kinds of stone just like there is in wood. And you can cut it. And they hit this thing and a big block come out of it about like this. So they said, we can't use that one there. We will start the building right here on it. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Coincidence? I mean, coincidence? I mean, everywhere you looked, he's just, he's just small talking. And we're realizing, chapter and verse, chapter and verse, this book is accurate. I don't even know if it's accurate about the things that have been. It might be accurate about the things that will be. And there's a, there's a message. We need to get on board on this thing. It should be the incentive I need. Boy, would I love to be spiritually in shape when my Lord doth come. I love to meet Him confident and not ashamed. I've got a new incentive. God, take me to the next level. I've been walking along like this. God, help me to get going. I feel like I've just been living off yesterday's grace. And God has been good and been merciful to me. But I think there's more. I think God wants to reveal more to us in this day in which we live. I quoted Ezekiel 37. Oh, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. And he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, saying to these bones, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God upon these bones, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinew upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath into you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord God. That is happening in Israel. Israelites who have been just caught up in this world are now caught up in something totally different. Why does the world hate us so much? We have done them good. Why? There's a reason. God said they're going to hate you. For my name's sake. He said, I saw them all laying there. Life was corpse. But there was no breath in them. What's happening right now is the Spirit of the Lord is moving on Israel. From unbelievers to the Messianics who are being evangelistic. Man, they're taking it to the streets. Israel, get ready. Our Lord's about to come. They're catching it. I caught some of it while I was there. Because September, no, excuse me, May 14th, 1948, the prophecy of Ezekiel was filled, fulfilled when they became a nation. Did you know that for 2,600 years, when God took them out of the land and punished them, wrote, by the way, when God punishes His people, He will always bring up another nation against them to do it. I want you to listen, man. If you think America is the America that your forefathers knew, you're nuts. We are not the same nation, and God will, if He's going to judge, and he, by the way, He judges His people. There are believers in this country who know and love God. He's going to raise up another nation. I want to be ready. I said, okay, God. Back to this. Here's Ezekiel. May 14th, 1948. After I quoted that, I said he brought them out of their graves and brought them all over the world and he established a nation state for 2,600 years from Ezekiel's prophecy till May 14th, 1948. They had never been a nation. They declared their independence and God took ten and ran off a thousand and established a nation. That should tell us something. That's in the time clock. When I quoted that and said that was fulfilled May 14th, our guide looked at me and went, you've got her. Well, 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago, another prophet made a prophecy. His name was John. And just like Ezekiel, when Ezekiel said, the hand of the Lord is upon me and the Spirit of the Lord carried me out, John said, I was in the, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a voice saying, I got news for you. The book of Revelations is the last thing to be fulfilled. And we're near it. In fact, it says, Blessed is he who... 2,000 years ago, he said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written in it, for the time is at hand. This means at hand. This isn't at hand to you guys. Because you're not close enough. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. The church has been living with an eminent expectancy of Christ's return. But they didn't have near the ammunition we've had. They didn't have nation regained. They didn't have prophecy like Ezekiel's prophecy fulfilled. It's been fulfilled. Can I tell you something? Them Jews are about ready to start kicking into gear at temple. And by the way, the mosque, the Dome of the Rock, is not on the holy place. Any of you been to Israel and been through one of these tours? You can use. Cool. By the way, the Dome of the Rock looks like my thumb compared to my arm to the temple 
son. I mean, it's a 14-story mammoth thing could be set right next to it. How do you know that's what the battle is over, the city of Jerusalem? Do you know my secret desire? Every, every since I committed my life to Christ, within about a year, I was reading Scripture, and I kept seeing Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's mentioned over 800 times in the, New Test, uh, in the Bible. And I said, God, I want to see Jerusalem. I want to see the city. I told my wife, I said, that's been my secret desire. I've memorized verses. I, by the way, I pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem every day. I've paid it for 20 years. Do you know when I went up to the wailing wall? Joyce had a whole bunch of prayers she was going to pray when she went up there. I said, I've got one prayer. I'm going to put my hand on the wall and pray in a prayer I've been praying for 20 years. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace within her walls and peace within her palaces. Because Jerusalem will never have peace until the Prince of Peace touches. What I'm praying for, just come, Jesus. Just come ahead on. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. It's going to happen. So I don't believe that. I had a guy one time I was talking to him about the Lord and I ended up talking about the coming of the Lord and he rolled his eyes and said, right, I'll believe that when I see it. I said, you sure will. <laughs> I you know it won't take any faith in those days. Would you agree with that? Here it takes faith. You, yeah, it's a, too late to believe then. Oh, I'm here. Hmm. I really wanted to close with something different than that, but we're out of time. I'll close with this. Matthew twenty four thirty five. Many of you men know this verse. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. You know what the next verses are? You know what the context of that is in the Olivet Discourse? He says, but of that day, what day? The day that heaven and earth pass away. A whole new dynamic of living is going to take place. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. You know what that means? Business as usual. Everybody's living like you got another tomorrow. And they knew not until the day Noah entered into the ark. That's significant. You go back to Genesis when he entered the ark, you know what it says? And seven days more. For seven days he was on there and the people outside were thinking, where's that crazy old man at? By the way, do you know who shut the door? God shut the door. And he's on there with them animals and people are thinking, what is that crazy old man doing in there? And they knew not until the day came, until the flood came and took them all away. Hmm. He said, I'm judging her with water the first time and I'll never do that again. Rainbow? The second time, he says, the heaven and the earth. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein it shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what man person ought she to be in all holy living and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God in which the heavens being on fire shall pass away and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. I'll give you one more verse and I'll be done. And there are so many more. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I, John, by the way, he's been seeing things that have been freaking him out. When he got a glimpse of who Jesus is, this one's come back, not a lamb to be slain, but a ruler to rule. He said when he saw him, he fell to the ground like, like he was dead. And God said to him, come on, I want to show you some things. And I want you to write them down and send it to the seven churches that are Asia. So I want you to do this. So he's, got him, he's revealing these things to him. Just one thing. Now this is one of the last things he sees. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. Over 70% of this globe is covered with land masses of water. With masses of water. Bodies of water. I cannot imagine a heaven and an earth where there is no sea. But the new one will have no sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and her great voice in heaven saying, The tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall be their God. And he will dwell with them, and God himself shall be their God. And he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. 
but a hallelujah place. Hmm. Heavenly Father, take the avalanche of disjointed thought. And it certainly has been that. I've not had Roman numeral 1, 2, 3. And God, I, I confess the intent is to stir. Help us. Would you save the lost and sanctify the saved? May we somehow embrace a truth this weekend that will encourage us with an incentive to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Godliness will not happen in our sleep. We become participants in this. God, I confess to you a deep need be more of a participant. Oh God, protect me, please, and all of us from extremism of any kind. From the poor marathon runner who wears out his knees and hips and joints way before his time. From those of us who grow weak and lazy because we're not about the moderate principle of exercising ourselves unto godliness with reason, with truth to guide us. Protect us from both extremes, God. Bring us closer to where truth is at in that delicate environment of balance. Not a man in this room who's married doesn't want to be a better husband. If you bless the fruit of his union and given him children, there's not a man here that does not want to be a better father or grandfather. God, we live in a culture and as has always been this way where the enemy has shot at us and discouraged us and kept us from moving on. Help us this week. God, somehow maybe pick up the Spirit this evening as we consider what we need to do. Encourage us, dear God, I pray. Hmm. And we'll be careful to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.